Okay, got it. <laughs> mm -hmm. So it's 12, 20, 12.30, should we begin at 12.31? We, sh we should begin. Yes. All the speakers are here. Somebody has their hand up. Um, Catherine. Right. Oh. Um, oh, let me, I'll let me, Catherine, I think I just. Un we can, we should mute everybody but the speakers. Right. <laughs> and apologies for that. What is for clarity of sound. All right. Oh, that's you? Where's she? People are still coming in, so we'll give it one more minute if that's okay. No, people will keep coming in, so I think we, should, we can start. Okay. I'll be admitting them. Okay. <laughs> okay. Great, so, so why don't we get started, everyone? First of all, I'd like to say good afternoon. Um, and I realize there are people on this call from all over the world, but it's afternoon here in New York City at <laughs> College. So I'd like to thank you all for being here today as part of our Woman, woman Festo. Um, I am Anthony Brown, Chief Diversity Officer here at Brooklyn College. And I'm just absolutely delighted and excited to be a part of this program and to have it as a part of our We Stand Against Hate initiative. Uh, I've talked to uh, Dr. Okumi about this and, and from the minute she brought this up, we were excited here at Brooklyn College. Um, Tunji Fussell, our Associate Director here in the Office of Diversity and Equity will give Dr. Okumi, uh, Dr. Okumi a uh, proper introduction, but thank you all so much for being here and welcome to Brooklyn College, at least virtually. Hopefully we'll see you here on campus one day. Thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. And as um, Anthony Brown mentioned, I am Tanji Fussell, Associate Director of Diversity and Equity Programs. And thank you again for joining us for this We Stand Against Hate initiative, which has been a fixture on our campus since 2018 when it was started by President Michelle Anderson. And throughout the years, the initiative has featured various lectures, concerts, um, training, all about enhancing and understanding and celebrating the voices that make up our diverse community. And speaking of diverse communities, I want to recognize the support of our co-sponsors for this event. Departments, Africana Studies, Political Science, Philosophy, Puerto Rican and Latino Studies, History, Sociology, Women and Gender Studies, the Women's Center, and the Ethel R. Wolf Institute for the Humanities, which this is also a part of their Black Lives Research and Action Engagement Series. So, Woman Manifesto, Nigerian Women Fighting for Equal Political Space, is definitely and informative one. But before I begin to introduce our moderator, I would like to ask everyone to mute their microphones. And if you have questions, please load them in the chat. And moderator for today, Professor Balu Olufonke Okome. Born in Nigeria, Professor Okome is an international political economist whose regional specialization is in continent. Educated at the University of Abidjan, Nigeria, Long Island University, New York, Columbia University, New York. She's a professor of political science at Brooklyn College, CUNY. Past Women's Studies Program Director and past Deputy Chair for Graduate Studies in the Department of Political Science. Her teaching includes a focus on the meaning of inclusive, equitable citizenship in the context of the interplay between globalization, democratization, democratization, and economic development. She founded hashtag Bring Back Our Girls New York City and is the author of many publications. And she's working on a book titled Gender, Power, and Leadership in the African Initiated Church in Nigeria and in her diaspora. 
with Professor Okome. Yes, good afternoon and thank you so much for that generous introduction, Sonji. And thank you very much, Anthony, for your, um, for your support and for your um, interest in this subject. I um, am appreciative also to all the co-sponsoring departments whom Tunji has um, enumerated. Um, it makes me, it gives me a very warm feeling that now I'm part of a community that cares about Africa and Nigeria to have all that support. So today we're going to, you all know the topic, Womanifesto, Nigerian women fighting for equal political space. I wonder how many people know about Nigeria, you know, um, but if you don't know, you will find out at least one aspect today of Nigeria's beautiful, complex, and um, dynamic um, political uh, history and also contemporary relations in terms of gender equity, which we're focusing on, and the larger political issues in the country. So I am multitasking by letting people in. Please, somebody else should do that. Today, we have a distinguished panel of speakers to address the key questions on gender equity and political participation for women in Nigeria. So I'm going to introduce them um, in alphabetical order. And I did the PowerPoint thing. I hope I find it now. Um, so, somebody wants to come in. I hope everybody can see my screen. Hello, can you see my screen? Yes, I'm assuming. Yes. All yes. right. So let yes. me make a slide show and um, from current slide. Okay, so Womanifesto is our topic today, how Nigerian women are resisting marginalization and fighting for political space. And um, we have a wonderful set of panelists. Um, so from the left on my screen, you have Dr. Lydia Umar. We have Dr. Abiola Akiyo Deafolabi and Professor Joy Ezeilo. With permission, I now have to just call them by their first names. Thank you, sisters. So here's Dr. Akiyo Deafolabi, Abiola Akiyo Deafolabi. Um, this is a woman who is a dynamo. And I think if you didn't know before, you will <laughs> find out as we go on with our program. So Dr. Akiyode Afolabi is the Executive Director of Women Advocates Research and Documentation Center, or WODC. She's a prominent voice of the feminist movement in the African continent, and she's a fierce advocate for gender equality, for increased voice and participation of women and girls in all aspects of life. Abiola is an unapologetic advocate for gender rebalancing in resources, legal rights and participation, as well as equal social relations. She emphasizes specific needs of women to promote gender justice in her multi-ethnic, multi-religious and multi-cultural um, context. She's past chairperson of the Transition Monitoring Group, which is a powerhouse of it in Nigerian politics. And this is the largest civil society coalition on elections in Nigeria. She's also acting secretary of the West African- Manifesto. 
the West African law and um, I've missed my place and religion society and a former student leader as well as the oh, 19th Marco is part of my first professor uh, Dr. Omar mute please oh um then um so I can't say everything about Ab Abiola she's a peace and security um, I want law. the letter I'll do Human that rights I'm sending this thing. activist. Everybody, please mute. Thank you. She's a prominent member of Bring Back Our Girls movement. She's also um, her group, her, her organization has been recognized um, as one of the top human rights and justice organizations in Nigeria. I can say more, but please permit me to stop here. Now, Professor. Joy Ngozi Ezeilo is um, a member of the order, right? O O N order. Hmm, I can't tell, but it's the one of the top honors that Nigerians can receive um, for recognition um, in national service. So Professor Ezeilo is a distinguished professor of law and also the emeritus dean of law at the University of Nigeria, Nsuka. She's also the former United Nations Special Rapporteur on trafficking um, in persons, especially women and children from 2008 to 2014. She um, is highly qualified with a PhD and multiple legal degrees. She also is a versatile legal scholar who is recognized as a leading authority in the field of international human rights, especially on the rights of women and children in Africa. She is the founder of Women Aid Collective or WACO and TAMA SARC. She's also one of the pioneers of teaching of women, children and the law in Nigeria and she developed a curriculum for the teaching of human rights, health law. I mean, human rights, health law, and reproductive rights in Nigerian universities. Um, she's an award-winning scholar. And, you know, I have everything listed here that we can fit on one page, but there's more. This is a woman who has worked in over 100 countries across all regions of the world. She um, I mean, it, the distinctions that she has received, if I were to list them, it would take up the whole program. So uh, Professor, please permit me to just say welcome. We're um, looking forward to hearing from you. Let me just close by saying that um, Professor Joy's um, efforts have provided pro bono and legal aid services to over 50,000 women, children, and the poor in the last 25 years. She has an enviable public service record, and she's served and continues to serve on the board of national and international organizations. She's a high chief in Igbo land, and she's fondly called triple chief, that is Ochendo Ada Ejiji. And I'm sure I'm mispronouncing some of this, forgive me. And Nze Buna, Chief. So welcome, Hi Chief, Chief, Triple Chief. Welcome. Dr. Lydia Umar. Dr. U Lydia Umar is a teacher and educator by training. And she also holds a PhD in curriculum development. She's a seasoned teacher. She served as lecturer in Atamadu Belo University and for 33 years with the Kaduna Polytechnic. And after she retired from teaching in 2015, she um, has engaged social activism on a really high powered level. Um, she has several professional papers and publications to her credit. And she was appointed member of the Co uh, governing council of the Kaduna State University in 2010. She um, is also currently serving as member 
of the Governing Council of Knock University, also in Kaduna State, and the Federal Polytechnic in Kaltungo, Gombe State. She runs a crash and a playhouse besides being executive director of Gender Trust, I mean, Gender Awareness Trust, or GAT. She's a development worker. Uh, she has volunteered for NGOs and she co-founded uh, the Gender Awareness Trust in 2000. She's been executive director since 2015. Under her leadership, Gender Awareness Trust has implemented over 70 projects in the areas of democracy, good governance, gender, human and women's rights, public health, reproductive rights, and peace building. She does conflict resolution and human security work as well. She's recognized in Nigeria and internationally, and she's a women's rights defender and peace building practitioner. Um, so I will skip also and say, oh, sorry, I didn't go to, um, I will skip and say that Dr. Jo, um, Linda, I mean, Lydia, I'm so sorry, has served as a consultant to develop a five-year strategic plan for the Peace Commission in Kaduna State. That's a weighty responsibility. She's a leader on women's issues such as political participation and gender-based violence. She works in Kaduna State in the Northwest West zone of Nigeria and all through the country. Um, she has developed a lot of interventions to promote the representation of women in politics and leadership through advocacy. She also is the chair member, uh, chair of the International Regional national and local organizations. She led in 2018, the process of getting the Violence Against Persons Prohibitions Bill passed into law in Kaduna State. So welcome everyone. Welcome to our panelists. We are eager to hear from you. And thank you to everybody that made the time to come and be with us today um, to hear from our noble and courageous panel. So brief intro to Nigeria, you know, um, the population is over 200 million. Uh, it's the seventh largest population in the world. People are saying that by 2030, Nigeria would be the third largest population in the world after China and India. Um, so one, in every 43 people in the world, if we're taking the uh, over 200 million, is Nigerian. Then mm -hmm. one in every four African and one in every seven black persons. So the GDP and per capita you see, so you see the per capita income in Nigeria is really atrocious, but the wealthiest African is a Nigerian. So the inequality, uh, level in Nigeria is profound. I think I will kind of stop here. I shared some of this with people before. Nigeria ranks very low on women's political participation, but I'm not going to steal the thunder from our uh, panelists. I'm going to just go now and say welcome again. And we have various questions for you. And at first, we thought that maybe um, Professor Ezeilo would be held up um, by trying to get on the plane, but I'm so happy that she changed her travel plans to accommodate us. So, um, as the moderator, my sisters would have to forgive me when I kind of say, okay, we want to move on to the next question because we have a lot of ground to cover. Um, so when it's time, you'll see me kind of <laughs> wave my hand and I'd like you to uh, stop and let the next person answer the question. So thank you for honoring that. Um, I think we'll start with um, hmm, letting each speaker, starting with Abiola, you know, we're going in alphabetical order. Abiola, um, Joy, and um, 
Lydia, I'm using their last names, you know, to do the alphabetical order. So we'd like to know from each of you briefly why you're doing gender work in Nigeria. What kind of challenges and opportunities have you experienced? Abiola? On mute. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, Prof, uh, for this um, beautiful event. It's a pleasure uh, that um, you have been able to put this together with the university. Uh, it's a pleasure for us to be here. Um, well, what's started in the year 2000, and um, it was uh, founded by a group of young women uh, lawyers at that time. I think we were in our late 20s and early 30s uh, in 2000. And um, for me, I was um, a student student leader before um, that time when I was in the university and I've been working on the issue of human rights and I've been standing uh, to support um, uh, students and other vulnerable groups. And so that led me to get a scholarship to read, uh, specialize in international women rights law. And um, so I was right there finishing up and there was this whole story about Sharia and women's rights in Nigeria. And I felt that there was a need for me to come back to Nigeria and also support the voices of women, you know, to work around uh, issues of women's rights and Sharia law. And I think that led to the production about, of, um, I think the first uh, document around Sharia and women's human rights in Nigeria after the case of Safiya to, to, to uh, in, in Nigeria. And of, of course also led to my conversation around gender and constitution reform. And I, and I think the history of was started with that because um, our first project was around Sharia and gender and constitutional reform. So WOTSU was founded in the year 2000. And um, since then we've been working to uh, advocate for the rights of women. We have been, we believe so much in building solidarity. So we've been working across board, working with coalitions and organizations in Nigeria, because also we're a group of women lawyers. So we also uh, support litigation. We have uh, tried out about three or four strategic litigation in Nigeria around citizenship, around issues of sexual harassment in Nigeria. We also work around issues of policy uh, in, 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 in the country. Um, so I will stop here uh, just to Thank introduce- you. Uh, what All you right, have. so um, Joyce, can we hear a bit about you? About, about All right. your work? All right, I'll try to put this on, but uh, if my network becomes unstable as it is, um, I, I may be forced to remove the video, but for now, um, is, is a little bit is okay. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, Professor, for, for this uh, putting this together with your team, Professor Komo. I'm much appreciated. And then uh, we can see we have huge uh, participation. Uh, that's also an emphasis on the importance of, of this uh, topic. Um, for me, uh, it, it's uh, doing gender work or doing feminism. Uh, came from my personal experience. Uh, it's one of those uh, when the person becomes political and um, uh, the experience of my mother early in life when I was still in high school uh, made me to, as a widow, to at a very early age, uh, understood the, the differences or, or the low status women occupy in society and the dis systemic discrimination they face just by the mere fact that they are women. Actually, it made me to uh, go to law school because then I knew that lawyers are the ones that defend people. And I said, I'm going to read law in order to be a human rights defender. And here we are, uh, more than three decades, doing feminism, doing gender work, uh, advancing human rights uh, at look nationally, and internationally. I call it a journey from local to global. And uh, that's uh, uh, what we've been doing. And uh, we, we, we are happy that we're impacting lives. Uh, but again, on another note, uh, the challenges are, are too many, or call it roadblocks or barricades, uh, working in Nigerian environment, advancing women's rights, gender equality uh, is, is, is not an easy task. It's like always like one step forward, uh, 10 steps backward. Um, and, and it's been really, it requires a lot of 
uh, a, a lot of all with not only self-reflection, but again, self-encouragement, solidarity, and um, determination, an indefatigable spirit for you to continue to do, for one to continue to do what one does. Uh, yes, we have made some uh, progress and uh, in the over 100 years of existence of Nigeria, uh, because uh, the, the, the Nigerian state came into existence in 1914, and by 2014, they celebrated the 100th anniversary. Um, I had opportunity, for example, to do an analysis of the milestones and barricades with regard to women's rights. And I guess we'll come back to it. Thank you so yes, much. Yes, yes. <laughs> okay, so um, Lydia, can you please tell us about your work? I've introduced you, and we're going to give... Um, the participants links that tell them more about your work. So, Lydia. Uh, thank you so much. And I must say that I'm really uh, Prof, excited. We need to see to your whole face. We need to see your whole face. <laughs> Are you seeing uh, me now? Yes, yes. I, okay. I, I was just saying that I'm really excited to be here and to have this conversation today. Uh, and I appreciate the organizers for the show. I, I, when Joy started speaking, I was like, what? We've been working with Joy for so many years. Uh, well, you can so probably go off video. Years. I've never had. Can you, you can go off video because it seems like you have a, an unstable. It came, came from my, hello? Can you go off video so that we can hear you? Is that better now? Yeah, it's better. Okay, great. So I was just beginning to say that my story is very similar to that of Joy, except that uh, we are from different uh, sections of the country, which shows that uh, this gender discrimination is uh, is widely practiced everywhere in Nigeria. But just by way of background, I want to say that my passion stands very young and the same situation like Joy. My mom became a widow when I was primary five. And then the kind of practices I noticed she went through began to disturb me as to why she should go through that. And uh, at that moment, I made up my mind that when I grow up, I'm going to make sure that I, I work against all those widowhood practices, such as this inheritance. They take, took away everything that my mom had because like supposed to go back to her parents' home. Then I noticed also the issue of male preference. In, at the time that we were going to school, if a father had about eight children and couldn't afford to send all of them, it was the girls that were asked to remain at home and the boys would go to school. So we had so many girl child at home without education. The one that hit me the most was early marriage. For girls, it was okay for them and it is still in some areas of the north. It's normal for girls to be married out at age 10, 11, 12, but not for the boys. The kind of division of labor also that took place in the home that made the girl to do all the chores and the boys didn't have to do anything. All those things were instigating me from within and I was wondering why should that be? And so when I grew up and went to school also, I found the same thing was and that encouraged me. And in marriage, I've noticed. All okay, um, Do so Dr. Say, Umar. One, the Dr. Mindset. Umar. Dr. All right, Umar. Thank you. I think I, I thank you, and I, you know, I'm so sorry because what no, no, you're no, saying okay. is so meaningful, and we should hear it. Maybe we should invite everybody back <laughs> for another session. <laughs> um, so thank Why you so not? much. You have the time. <laughs> thank you for, 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 for letting us know what is motivating you to do this work and why the work is important. We are also grateful that um, we have a really uh, beautiful country. So I'm now going to turn to Dr. Um, to Professor Ezeilo. 
and say Nigeria is a unique country. It has a distinctive political history. It's very diverse in multiple ways. Can you let us know, you know, just like a thumbnail sketch of Nigeria's political history? So brief. We also want to have a brief account of the status of Nigerian women question. <laughs> what do people need to know that they might not be aware of? So this is for you, Dr. I mean, Professor Ezeilo. Um, if you can do it in four minutes, I'd appreciate it. Uh, on mute. Yeah, I said tall order, but I, I yeah, will so try. <laughs> I know you can. <laughs> I know we have a time a time issue. Uh, the Nigerian state uh, came into existence in 1914, and uh, it passed through colonial rule, and then again the independence in 1960, and some of those briefs that you gave. But what is really uh, you know interesting that has been become also a bane of not just the diversity uh, that we have in Nigeria, but also. Uh, but also uh, what is um, uh, the, the status of women that also impacts on the status of women or a lot of implication for status of women is the fact that uh, Nigeria have over 350 ethnic groups. So you can say is a multicultural um, and also pluralistic society. And with regard to that also, it has a complex legal system because uh, there is the receive English law, there is the Islamic law, then we have customary law on the other hand, then you have the competing, the modern legislation, and all of these uh, are granted uh, recognition uh, by the constitution rule of, in terms of rule of recognition. And uh, women's status vary. Uh, women are scattered he 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 hegemony. They are not homogeneous when you look at Nigeria and the status of women. So, but, but also even amongst all the ethnic or religious diversity that we have in Nigeria, what is also common is that in no ethnic group or religious group or a particular community do women enjoy equal right with men. So, um, so Nigeria also had a lot a, a history of military rule and militarization of the state, and also gave rise to a phenomenon we call uh, wifeism. You know, in the quest for democracy. Um, there were movement and women's movement, both around gender justice, democracy, and development. Um, uh, you know, meant that uh, all women women didn't pursue just like women's right in those uh, military. But ironically, also some of the few uh, milestones, like establishment of Ministry of Women Affairs, and then also ratification of some of the international treaties, happened. But the fact that Nigeria had to struggle for democracy for decades uh, also, uh, also meant that as soon as we had that democracy and the power shift, women were not already, women were already excluded from the military power block. So where the power is, women were far away. And even at, another, at the onset of democracy in 1999, after the transition we had, transition from military rule to civ uh, civilian rule or the democracy we still enjoy. Um, you find that women didn't get to occupy that space. And when just roll that back to colonial times, when even women had already even benefited from women's movement, global women's movement, especially for franchise, for the right to vote, and then even right of women to own property uh, as a femme soul on their own. Uh, so at independence, Nigerian women already had, it, had the right to vote, except that you know, Northern women, uh, the Northern uh, bloc because of religion didn't want their women to vote and they didn't vote until 1979 or, or, or like Southern women that had that right to vote and started enjoying that. So when you look at, uh, I'm just trying to <laughs> make the final point and yeah. connect the dot and connect the dots here. I know it's sad that we, we you know, we, we, you know, so that people uh, will be able to follow. So now, yeah. what I'm saying is that the constitution, like we run, and I know we'll come back to this, was forced on us, was imposed by the military rule, and it wasn't really like a people-centered or people-driven constitution, and that may all that has implication for human rights, for women's rights, uh, for the place and the status of women in modern-day Nigeria. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. And I'm so sorry to be the, uh, <laughs> the bad guy here. 
Um, so we, I also would like to ask you this question. What's the status of women in law and practice? And how has the women's movement navigated the situation? Mm. Um, uh, thank you. Uh, uh, here, I will make a quick distinction between the jury and de facto, the law in the books and law in action. So the jury, and you look at the constitution, uh, apparently it will seem that women, women enjoy equal rights uh, because the, the, the section 42 of the constitution prohibit discrimination. But even within that constitution, you begin to see discrimination against women, whether in the section that has to do with citizenship, with indigeneity, with access to power, with enjoyment of uh, or appointment into certain uh, position. So um, on paper, you can say the principle of equality and, and, and non-discrimination uh, means that women enjoy equal rights constitutionally. But in practice, that is far from uh, truth. And like I said, because of a uh, rule of recognition given to other systems of uh, laws like customary law, like Sharia law or Islamic law, also that does not often admit of equality or the notion uh, that women are equal to men. So it means that a woman's status may depend on the type of marriage contracted, for example, for married women. And then also, uh, so that means if you're married under the act, you may seemingly have a poor right. If you're married under customary law, it has its own implication. If you're also married under Sharia law, it has its own uh, legal consequences, both for the woman and for the children. And then also so the single women in terms of inheritance, right to land, their property, there are distinctions. But in a nutshell, women do not enjoy, I will say, equal rights, whether in law or in practice. And women's voices are yet to count in the making of laws, including making of the constitution of Nigeria unlike in the past. And that was the point I wanted to end with last time, where even women were involved during colonial time in the making of the constitution, including transition. Some of them were, went to Britain and they were in London in Lancaster House negotiating Nigerian constitution at independence. But now, I mean, women even at the, at the, with, with the military rule and even at the transition, didn't even make the list of those that drafted the constitution that the military imposed of Nigeria, thank you. Thank you very much. Just one question though. The constitution is being um, amended. Are women part of that process in any kind of significant way? Uh, not in significant way, but they are part of it to the extent that elected women representative of parliamentarians are participating. But when you look at the number of women and the numerical strength of women in parliament and in national parliament is less than 7%. So if you have a voice that is less than 10% of those who are making the constitution, then you can begin to understand why it's so difficult or difficult environment to work and to agitate for women's issue and to really make significant progress. Okay, so I'm gonna come back to you uh, because you have been in an advisory expert um, capacity with the National Assembly. I'm going to come and ask you that question about, you know, what um, what it's what you are accomplishing and um, what the challenges might be. But let me now turn to Abiola and Lydia and ask the question about the Constitution being amended. What is your assessment? about the process and how the process deals with gender equity. So who would like to go first? <laughs> or should I just pick on somebody? Lydia, why don't you go first? <laughs> okay, is Abiola ready? It seems yes, like I'm ready. Okay, so why don't you go first and then Lydia can follow. Well, um, you know, Nigeria, Nigeria, Nigerian women have been battling with the issue of the constitution right from, let me say, the beginning. Uh, the first um, constitution was 1922, Clifford's constitution. And of course, this dream uh, showed that the constitution was also not inclusive of women. Um, and that ran through 
even the independent constitution, despite the fact that, you know, women were um, in uh, London and all, all other places where independence was negotiated, you know, the constitution is still not well gendered. And of course, just as my sister, the prof said, in 1999, the uh, constitution uh, came into being by uh, a group of um, military men. So, which also excludes uh, women. So my point is that we have had a history of you know, exclusion within the constitution. In Akafa, had one of the most robust aspects of the constitution, which has to do with uh, sex discrimination, came into the constitution in 1979. So, and it's also still been emphasized and negotiated even up to 1989. Um, so the, the current constitutional uh, process has also excluded women, but Fortunately, this year, in the last 10, 15 years, women have been very active in the process of demanding, you know, for a constitution that is sensitive, you know, to them. And we have had uh, different demands, up to about 10 point demands of what we want to be reformed, you know, in the constitution. Uh, in the last uh, constitutional amendment process, which took place in the last two years, about five of those issues were able to make that point thanks to, uh, uh, women who are also part of the constitution drafting committee and women organizations that are also working outside the constitution drafting uh, committee. About five issues then came up eventually, uh, which we call gender bills, which I hope Professor Joy is going to speak more about, which were uh, basically speaking to five key issues affecting women's rights in Nigeria. The first being the issue of citizenship. As we speak, we have a section uh, we have a constitutional no, provision. Give us a list. Give us a list. <laughs> because uh, right. media. So, also so has to... we have issues around indigenship. Uh, there are also issues which, which relate, related to the issue of affirmative action, either in political appointments or in um, political offices or affirmative action with respect to uh, um, political parties. So, those are the five issues that we're able to negotiate. But unfortunately, those issues were not taken by the National Assembly. Thank you so much. So, uh, Lydia, can you also speak to this issue of the constitutional amendment and your assessment about whether it responds to Nigerian women's demand for gender equity? Lydia. Thank you very much. Um, thank you. First, yes, can you hear me? Yes. Hello? Yes, yes. The recent um, constitutional review process that has taken place in Nigeria not long ago, just this last year, uh, saw a situation where there was a lot of exclusion of young people because the process itself actually can be described as non inclusive of a a majority of women, most of whom are in the rural areas. The, the women that attended the review process consisted mainly of civil society organization, uh, academia, the lawyers, and so on. But the real women at the grassroots were left out of the process. And that is why I view that process as non-inclusive. However, a lot of the women issues and gender issues were represented at such constitutional reviews in the six zones of the country. The 1999 constitution as amended right now has got a lot of gender gaps in it. That is one of the things that Abiola was mentioning, the five gender issues that we have been pursuing, things on citizenship, indigenship, affirmative action and the rest of them. And it is because the, the National Assembly did not take those into cognizance. That is why high NAS even came up so that we could represent and get them to vote for us. But like you will hear from Joy later, they threw that, um, they threw our efforts out of the window and now the women had no choice than to start, than to go back to the state level, which is where we are right now. For me, I will say that 
the process is not very, very inclusive. Uh, and um, the, 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 the politicians that have claimed that they've gone to every zone, it's not every woman that can leave her state and travel to the zone. So the need for them to make it more, maybe from, from, from um, down upwards will be better. If they had started maybe from the local government areas, gotten the, the, the input of women at that level and use, and then gone to the state and the federal, that would have been more inclusive. Thank you. Thank you. Funke, unmute. Unmute. Yes, now, now I'm, I'm guilty also. I want to ask um, Joy this question because now the constitution is being um, amended and you are an expert advisor to the House of Representatives on constitution review. What are the key or relevant issues? What are the priority issues for women in the constitution? And what role did the manifesto play in this respect? And you know, if I was going to be rude, I would say, do those people listen to you? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, we are we are technical uh, technocrats and technical <laughs> experts, and we put in um, we, we try to do comparative analysis of constitutions in the world, not, and especially in Africa and then to see what progress women have made in terms of constitutional uh, uh, achievement and inclusion in all that part of Africa. And when we do that comparison, we also bring it to the attention of the lawmakers. So um, on, on, on one hand, just as a prelude, to say that women faced to, uh, had already articulated positions of women, uh, which it made clear and which I'm sure Abdullah will speak more to. Uh, but then with regard to the House, uh, the, the house of Representatives, and the Constitution Review Commission, uh, Committee uh, and, and the work around the, because it's a major work to amend the Constitution. And for far too long, women had been agitating for inclusion in the supreme law of the land, which is the Constitution. Uh, so uh, the, 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 at, at the level of the committee before the preliminary, we achieved um, five major, uh, I call it milestones. And the first was uh, on the issue of additional seat that we see an increased representation of women in parliament. And you know, this is very crucial, even if you're looking at sustainable development goal and goal five and indicators for measuring progress by countries. And one of that is the number of representation uh, of, of women in parliament. And like I've said, in Nigeria, we still have under 10% representation. So that was indeed a milestone. The women work hard for it, especially uh, one of uh, right honorable uh, Nkiru Nya Jocha. And they got that bill passed. So they, at the level of the House of Representatives, it wasn't in the Senate, I've been issue. And then when they had the plenary, it was also adopted. Then we had a provision that has been a vest issue. The fact that Nigerian women who marry foreign spouses are unable to give them citizenship by virtue of that marriage. And this is a right that men have enjoyed at from, from the beginning or from independence. If a Nigerian man marry a foreign wife, they automatically they will get citizenship by registration, by natural, and all of that. But it doesn't apply. So that was also, as it, it, it was gotten in, and uh, it was has been long been part of demand of women's movement in Nigeria, including women in face so, and then on the affirmative action, affirmative action, it was still decimal because women have been agitating for at least 30%, which was adopted in Beijing uh, and 35% in the national gender policy. So the 35% was taken for executive position at political parties level. But when it came to actual appointment of ministers, you know, uh, like secretaries of state, you know, I mean, not secretary of state, but you know, in departments in, in the U.S. ministerial position. When it comes to, uh, to that, it was just mere ten percent, and you will agree with me that ten percent is not uh, anything significant. It's actually tokenism. But the 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 uh, and then also, so there were about five major issues. I think I've listed all the five that women achieve 
but it wasn't the affirmative action we wanted. But then it, uh, it, it was adopted and it passed very well at the House of Representatives. And when they had the joint session uh, of uh, House of Rep and the Senate, it also uh, passed through. So, but at the plenary, when, the, when it was voting time, for them to put <laughs> there to, to really affirm what the constitution, the, the great work the constitution review committee has done, uh, then the vote, uh, they didn't stand up the vote. Actually, sometimes you wonder whether also some part of the members did vote against what also as a committee they had already adopted. But they, in the end, women lost all five what we could have, what we counted as a milestone achievement. So it's like back to the drawing board. So again, this was the, what my statement at the beginning, one step forward and you think we are seeing the light uh, in the, at the end of the tunnel and all of a sudden, it's just like, uh, you know, 10, 10, 10 steps backward. So it's always a struggle. And women struggle uh, in Nigeria from <laughs> colonial. Okay, I think, let me, let me stop here. Uh, we, we might come back and then I can make some further comment on the on constitution and constitutionalism yes. and, and why we are still a laggard in Africa. Thank you. Thank you. You are my own true sister. <laughs> um, <laughs> I want to quickly move to Abiola and say, you know, Joy um, has told us briefly about Womanifesto. What is Womanifesto? Why was it founded? What were the priority areas identified by Womanifesto and why is it necessary to have Womanifesto? All right, um, thank you so much, Prof. Um, Womanifesto is um, a charter of women demand and which came up uh, first in 2005 when there was a national uh, political conference and um, women were uh, marginalized uh, in that national political conference which was then called by uh, the then president Olusegun Obasanjo. Uh, so led by Professor Dadisola Konde of blessed memory under a group called Wanako, uh, the women came together and I was uh, the secretary of that convening in 2005, uh, where uh, women were brought together to identify issues affecting you know, women and also use it as a way of engaging uh, the then national political conference. And I could also recall that at that time, uh, women also went to court also to challenge uh, some of the uh, issues of uh, discrimination against women. Now, in 2019, so women at different times have also come up with different charter after, after that charter, a charter for political parties, uh, charters at different you know, levels. Um, so in 2017, we started off a platform, uh, which was then called Manifesto uh, as a way of pushing that a charter of demands of the Nigerian women. And um, in 2019, we, are, we, all, we all organized uh, a big conference, uh, which was called the Women Manifesto Conference, and had over 2,000 women, where we looked at what we had in 2005, and adjusted and adapted, and then come up with a uh, sixth demand. Uh, the first one was looking at violence against women, and we're going to use some of these demands to determine what we're going to be doing in the coming period. And one of the issues there was for us to work around the clear state of emergency, you know, establish structures that can respond to uh, issues of violence against women, uh, ensure that in our different ways as organizations and groups, you know, we also support the uh, special courts and the passage of laws. If you look at uh, now, we have had almost 31 states between 2017 and now. More states have passed, 2019 and now, more states have passed the violence against persons prohibition law because of the work that women groups are doing all across the country. So we need a space, a space for women where we can discuss, where we can agree, you know, on some issues and also act. Uh, so we had five issues, but issues on women's political participation too. Uh, the one first also came up with demands and also ways with which we can ensure that we get women's political participation. Uh, the third issue was women and the economy. Uh, we also came up with demands to respond to 
the marginalization that we see uh, in uh, issues of economy for women, the issue of women in agri, the issue of the fact that women till the land and they represent about 70% of small older farmers. Still yet, uh, women still don't, 10% of women have lands in Nigeria owned by them. Um, okay. So we Adiola, about, we're going to share, we're going to share the document with people who want it. I want you to, fast track us through it <laughs> yeah that, that's what i'm doing anyway yes <laughs> so, the, so the other issue is also the issue of women peace and security and also sexual and reproductive rights of women so these were the issues that we found that are very key and important and um, this was produced by the gender and constitutional reform network which professor joy is also sharing and so at the last page you also have the key demands by women with respect to the issue of um, uh, gender and constitution reform. So these are then become, this became like our charter and we have been using this to uh, respond to a whole lot of issues, you know, in Nigeria. Thank you so much. And I'm so sorry because what you're saying to us is really significant and they are very important issues. A lot of work was done to first of all um, be as inclusive as possible and then to get consensus and then to write this up and to put it in easily digestible um, um, version. So kudos to everybody that did the work and I'm so sorry that I'm rushing you through this, but we have a lot of ground to cover. So Lydia, you work on political participation and civic engagement and you do peace building work. What is the status of women presently in those areas? And what more do you think we can do? Thank you very much. The status of women presently in Nigeria with regards to political participation, uh, I must say is a bit embarrassing. When we look at other countries in Africa, like Rwanda, South Africa, and so on, um, in Nigeria, it is it is extremely low. We have no representation of women in governance. Yeah, governance generally, and this can be looked at from two ends: appointive positions and then the elective ones. With appointive positions, even at the federal level, not to talk of the state level, is as low as twenty percent. As against the title fence, has been recommended and adopted by government by itself through the national gender policy. And then the elective positions, we are still as low as 5%. Because in our national assembly, both the upper and the lower house, we have very few women. As senators, we have only seven females. And we have only seven out of 109. Uh, are, are females. They, you have only 22 out of 16 members of the House of Representatives. This is extremely low. And um, when you get to the state level, it's, the, the picture is even darker because Nigeria has 36 states and um, 15 of those states have zero female representation in their state houses of assembly. You have about nine of those states having only one female in the assembly, two females in about five states, three females in about three states, four in about three states, and only one state has managed to get to five females out of 25. So you can see that the situation is really, really bad with regards to uh, political participation of women. But I want to say here that even at the political party level, the situation is not better. Because most of only give one position, they call woman leader in their hierarchy, their leadership hierarchy, the executive, which is extremely bad. Now, I want to say here that we are still 20% below, and every effort women have made seem not to pay off. 
And some of the reasons behind that, I must say very quickly, behind the, uh, the low representation. First of all, we have what we Okay, so um, Dr. Olivia, as yes. Please, yes. Um, help yes. us and and give us like a final word on this because we the still have a lot of questions. <laughs> is that we are not? It, it doesn't look as if our situation is likely to improve in the near future, and I'm saying that the women's efforts has not has not uh, been recognized at all. And the things that make it worse is monetization of the political parties. All right, thank you so much. We're going to, system. I want people to If you to look at ask, the amount of money that has been, has, that has been. Dr. Lydia, let yes, people please. ask questions and you know, in the Q&A, you'll have an opportunity to um, also give us more information because okay. we still have a lot of questions for you. And right. I want the audience to be able to also engage you. Uh, so okay. please forgive me. Um, no, no. I would like to know, Abiola, and also um, Joy, what's the connection between this womanifesto and Occupy Nas? And then Occupy Nas has ended. Has it ended? Why did it end? What is happening now? What are the next steps to accomplish the objectives of Women Manifesto? Actually, all three of you can chip in on this, but then I'm going to be very brutal. So make it very brief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, of course, um, um, like you know, I, I was also, so to say, in the room and the table negotiating this uh, uh, law, being an advisor and technical advisor, and then based on also what Nigerian women want and my experience as a lawyer, professor, uh, also working in this area. But then uh, for the charter of demands and women manifesto, uh, those demands have been persistent and that's what women want. And when women fail to get what they want, uh, especially inclusion, in the constitution or in a law that they would, the law of the land that they will also be bound by, then they went on protest, rightly so, uh, for not getting their fair share. And that, if it has stopped, the major actors on that will have to speak that. But I believe that you, 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 the, the fight continue and the struggle continue and it's not over at all. And Nigerian women will not give up. Thank you. All right, thank you. Abiola quickly, and then Lydia, get ready, because I'm going to well, give Abiola I, just a little I think time. You give us some, I think you should <laughs> give us a little bit of time to explain this nexus. Um, okay. You know, as I said, the one, the manifesto itself is a movement, and we all convene and speak to one another like on daily basis. We might not have seen ourselves for a year, but we talk on daily basis, and we strategize and develop yeah, whatever we want to do. When the uh, house shut down those bills, we came back on the manifesto and said, are we going to sit down like this? Are we going to wait for elections? We said, no, tomorrow we all have to be there and let them know that we can no longer, you know, continue to accept being pushed away as Nigerian women. So it was a decision of the manifesto uh, movement. So, and that was what happened. So the second day, the National Assembly was shocked how we were able to mobilize ourselves. And that's the power of women. And that's the power of movement building. And we're able to get to the National Assembly to insist that there's no retreat, no surrender. And I want to say that up to today, we are still on it. There's no retreat, there's no surrender. We do it and do it again. Uh, we, uh, by standing there on the 8th of March, I also need to mention that because we were there in, in numbers, over 1,000 women on a daily basis, standing and closing down, shutting down the National Assembly, insisting that the National Assembly should uh, accept the gender bills. On the 8th of March, they moved back and they resigned three on three of those gender bills, which they are yet to vote for. Uh, another 14 days later, or after a month later, they came back to appeal to the women to allow them to vote on those gender bills. As we speak today, women are working at the state level. One of the issues that the National Assembly raised was that we didn't lobby them enough. So we have women organizations and groups 
Gender and Constitution Reform Network, National Coalition on Affirmative Action, 100 Women Lobby Group, Women in Political Forum, um, um, FIDA, and other coalition market women joining at state levels to ensure that they reach out to the Senate and the House of Work. As of two days ago, we have sent them a seven days ultimatum to respond to us on what is the next step. So we are not surrendering anything. We are still going to go on to incest. They have agreed that they are going to vote on three of those bills, and we're waiting until when that is done. Public officers cannot come publicly, make promises, and then just walk away at, and think they will not hold them accountable. The manifesto would continue to hold the National Assembly accountable on the issues of women. All right, thank you so much. Now, Lydia. Uh, let me just add here that uh, the connection between the manifestants is very clear in the sense that the manifesto leadership is one of those that initiated the entire idea of occupying us. They were part of the organizers, we were part of the mobilizers, and also implementing the actual occup occupation of the NAS protest. And uh, more importantly, it is that the five gender bills that are the issues that the manifesto has identified much earlier before this, um, before the occupying us, there are issues that we have been working with. I will recall that during the last constitutional reform uh, review, those are some of the issues that we presented. And so for, 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 for manifesto, it was like just war continue. From what we have been pushing to this time around that it was so obvious that there was a need to engage the legislators, engage the legislators the manifesto and other women groups did and we continue to do. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. So um, I think I'd like to know how many women came out for these protests? And then what is the, um, I think Abiola talked about women from Mention various, everything. oops, women from various sectors. So how many women, um, you know, what kind of, um, occupational or yes. um, let, yeah, let, me say, let me say that there, there was a national movement uh, that we had almost 16 states across Nigeria. Lagos had a huge crowd of over like um, 3,000 women where they came out and um, also stormed the State House of Assembly. Professor Joy led the Enugu theme and they had over like a thousand women also, you know, in Enugu who also stormed the National Assembly. So we had in Zamfara, we had in Sokoto, we had Rapa led uh, almost six states in the north, you know, to occupy various places. And uh, at the National Assembly itself, we had a woman in business, we have women in uh, politics, we have women in academia who joined that movement. So on the 8th of March, for example, there were over 3,000 you know, women in front of the National Assembly. And I think on the last day that we called of the National Assembly uh, uh, protest also, we had over you know, 2,000 women you know, uh, in that. So uh, the manifesto is a, is a huge movement. And so what is happening at the state level currently, we are mobilizing as many women as possible to be part of the manifesto movement. I think the time has come. This issue is about our dignity as a woman. It's about, it's about our being a Nigerian. It's about our Nigerianity. And we cannot continue to be robbed off, to get that to be robbed off you know, on, 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 on daily basis. So it is time for women in Nigeria to resist and get ourselves to the place of our pride. And that is exactly what the Western movement is pushing for. So I hear you and I want us to move quickly because you, I'm sure you want the, the audience to ask questions, right? Yeah. Um, there was a lawsuit also that was brought by some women-led NGOs against the Nigerian government. What was this lawsuit about? What are the issues? What's the outcome? What's the way forward? Uh, again, I'm asking all three of you, and now I'm going to let um, Lydia begin, and then Abiola, and then Joy. So, sisters, quickly. Or maybe, does Abiola want to begin? 
Thank you very much. You oh, okay. The lawsuit. Okay. No, no. Anyway, I'm the, the lawsuit, what is what I'm on. Abiola, <laughs> Lydia has come on. Wait. Right. I'm on. Lydia, okay, thank you. Yeah, the lawsuit that was brought by some women led NGOs against the Nigerian government. Um, mm. That lit litigation was actually led by the Nigerian Women Trust Fund and it's been on since 2020. And uh, the issues there have to do with uh, creating additional seats for women to increase women's representation in the National Assembly, because currently it stands at 5%, like I said earlier. Another issue was to enable Nigerian women to transfer citizenship to foreign husbands, a right that the Nigerian men uh, married to foreign spouses enjoy, and also to ensure affirmative action of at least 35% in political party administration and appointive positions across federal and state levels. Another issue was the provision of the minimum of 20% in the ministerial uh, appointments or commissioners, and then to allow a woman to become an indigenous of her husband's state. All right. So After five I'm years of the issues that were presented, and, um, and the relief was granted by the High Court, and uh, the implementation of the national gender policy provision of that 5% affirmative action policy of the federal government has now been, um, been granted by the court. Because the argument of the court is that failure to comply with that 35% is a violation, direct violation of constitutional provisions like in section 42, section 147 and 144 as well as the Article 19 of the African Charter on People and Human Rights. And so the High Court has ruled in favor of women, declaring that, that this anti-women posture is discriminatory and unconstitutional. Thank you. All right, Dr. Lydia, let's give um, Abiola and then um, Joy a chance to tell us also aspects that they would like to um, point our attention to. Anyway, let me just, um, thank you, Dr. Lydia. Um, let me just uh, chip in here. Um, um, we are one of the plaintiffs. Um, so the Women Advocates Research and Documentation Center, what to say. And um, this was led by um, the Women, Nigerian Women Trust Fund that I am also a director. Uh, and it was at a board meeting after the 2019 elections where the, we were assessing the, what happened to women in the 2019 election that we then decided at that board meeting that there was a need to uh, do an impact investigation to see whether we can contest the issue of discrimination against women as it is in section 42 of the 1999 constitution and also within it with the national agenda policy which was passed uh, which was adopted in the year 2006, you know, uh, in Nigeria, to, to say whether Nigeria is accountable to those instruments and also to the constitution. And that was what led us to the federal high court. And of course, uh, the federal high court, what the federal high court has done is to affirm the fact that uh, the national gender policy is potent. A country will not go and pass a policy, you know, adopt a policy and then do something else. And that in, in, in all appointed position, that um, it becomes very important that um, women would should be at least you know, that five percent. I want to say that there are other organizations who were part of this: the Women in Politics Forum, the National Women Trust Fund, the AGA, Center for Democracy and Development, the Vision Spring, FIDA. So about six or seven organizations were part of those who pushed for the uh, the victory. And for us, especially coming at this time. It's a big victory because what that is saying is that what we're negotiating at the National Assembly was for 20% in appointed position. But what the court had said is that women are entitled to 35% affirmative action based on the national agenda policy. And good enough, in March, on the 2nd of March, Nigerian government also adopted the revised national agenda policy for 2022. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much. Now, Joy. <laughs> 
Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I, I think, uh, yes, yeah, uh, is it, a victory for all. Is a victory for women in Nigeria. Is a victory um, uh, for for what uh, women represent and uh, what they fought all these years. Uh, but now the problem for me, and, and as a lawyer, I wish that the government will uh, respect and implement fully the decision of the court because it's one thing to get um, a judgment, another is to to have. Uh, to have that implemented again, given the complexity of the issues uh, involved and the fact that the 2023 election is uh, already around the corner and uh, the primaries have started. And if that is concluded, uh, I wonder how, but I, I think also uh, women uh, that have taken this thus far uh, are prepared to go to the next level uh, to make sure uh, to hold the government to, to account or to raise the accountability stake because it's one decision whose time has come. I recall in 1999, and that is how many years ago, when I also led a court action uh, to ensure that uh, women's uh, uh, affirmative action, women's uh, right uh, to participate in the government of their country is respected. And uh, yes, we lost in 1999, uh, when I took that action, and I recall the judge saying, women don't need to go to Beijing, uh, that I argued in a Beijing fashion, meaning that Nigeria wasn't ready to implement uh, the, the Beijing declaration and the program of action that recommended affirmative action. And now in 2022, we have seen another court, and by the way, uh, my classmate uh, at law school, uh, the judge, which I, I'm very proud of, uh, the decision and the and the fact that uh, he he really gave teeth to the existing legislation, and uh, we hope that the government will do the needful. And if not, Nigerian women are also ready to take it to the next level and ensure full interpretation and implementation of that decision. Because if that is frustrated, a right to effective remedy, it then means that at regional and international level, we can also seek for justice because Nigeria ratified those regional and international uh, uh, treaties and they have state obligation or responsibility uh, to implement, to enforce and to fulfill women's human rights. Thank you. We lost you. I'm mute. Mute, yeah. <laughs> That's my next question. I'm so sorry. And, you know, I would like it to be like a wrap up question because the two other questions I have are informational and they're going to be very brief responses from you. What other work are you doing on gender equity, each of you? How does it all connect with the manifesto and the struggle to accomplish gender equality for Nigerian women? Yeah, uh, for me, access to justice is very important in the work that I do. The fact that women whose human rights are violated uh, can come before the law court can, in search of justice, can get justice and can get effective remedy. And that's why I, I, I work uh, as a pro bono lawyer. That's why my organization, Women's Aid Collective and Tama Sexual Assault Referral Center, deals with the issue of not just sexual and gender-based violence, but in terms of uh, deal a lot with enforcement of law. And to that extent, we work with all administrators of justice, uh, whether in the criminal justice system, to train judges, to build capacities of police and other, other law enforcement agencies that are involved in administration of, of criminal justice to ensure that they have the right information and that they have the capacity to, uh, to, to render gender justice in cases involving women's rights. And it is paying off because uh, with some of those training and engagement uh, with judges, with lawyers, with, uh, with the police uh, and the prison officials, we are seeing uh, greater um, uh, judicial decisions that respect women's rights. And we have recorded there is a complete change in tide, for example, from, from decisions that previously did not recognize women's right inheritance to having decisions a number of them and cases that now recognize that a woman have a right and a constitutional right to inherit land, housing, property, just like their male uh, counterpart. And then, uh, of course, there is a number Excellent. of other work that I wouldn't have time uh, to deal with. But the Sexual Assault yeah. Referral Center yeah. one is one also close to my heart. And I'm currently the chairperson of Sexual Assault Referral Networks Nigeria. Thank you. 
Thank you. I'm going to ask everybody to give us info more um, links where we can find more information about your organization and also the collective work that is being done on gender justice in Nigeria. That would be my last question. Um, so, uh, Abiola, can you tell us what um, my question? What other work are you doing on gender equity? How does it all connect with the manifesto and the struggle for gender equality and equity in Nigeria? Well, um, one of the areas that we are focusing on in the coming period is to strengthen, is strengthen the women's movement uh, because we believe that uh, with alliance building and um, all of us coming together, you know, speaking in the same voice, we'll be able to address uh, a lot of issues issues that are affecting access to justice and also that are affecting the effectiveness of policy. So we're engaging uh, in a lot of policy advocacy. We're insisting that resources must be engendered. You can't just pass that one laws across the country and you don't put money there. It's time for, country, for the country to put their money where the mouth is. Uh, so we're gonna be working with policymakers to ensure and also building women's money to be able to make that demand and ensure that there are budgets, as we speak today, the budgets of the Women Affairs is the next. All the uh, budgets in Nigeria. So we're going to be insisting, and we're going to be uh, uh, ensuring that we build movements around making that you know, demand uh, in the coming year. So building the women's movement is one of our core mandates and ensuring that it's policy advocacy and intervention. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, now, Lydia. Thank you very much. Um, part of our work is sensitizing and building the capacity of women, particularly women aspirants and women who intend to take active and effective uh, part in, uh, in elections. And uh, also haven't discovered that uh, violence uh, against women increases no, during the uh, political... Sorry? Yes. I haven't, I haven't realized that um, violence against women during elections is a, is, is, is an, a serious issue. We put a uh, violence against persons prohibition law in Kaduna State. And what we admit right now is to give it life. Because like we all know, it is possible to have a law, but unless it comes alive and is being used um, it does not uh, amount to anything. So we, we, we are trying to enlighten the women that there is this law that exists and that they could use it, uh, especially when they are affected or when others are affected that they know. But more importantly, also our work in the area of women, peace and security um, has to do with the implementation of uh, resolution 19, 1325, the United Nations resolution which uh, Nigeria happened to develop the national action plan, in fact, first generation and second generation. And I happen to be one of those who developed that now. So we are looking at how far we have come in implementing the national action plan. And then we are thinking of working on a third, um, reviewing that second one and coming up with a third now. Those are some of the work and they connect directly with the manifesto because the manifesto wants to see the participation of women in all sectors of development. In all right, thank you so much. Security. Thank you, you know, so now this important question for all of you, where can we find more information on all these issues? Now, you know, if you can share uh, links, with us, um, it would be much appreciated. You can also compose, um, you know, information packages that we will then share with all participants later. But quickly now, one minute each. <laughs> oh God, we have uh, a lot of our information is on our website and then we have newsletter and uh, also, some of the um, laws that we have been involved in are actually on the on the internet, either under the state government or the federal government website. All right, thank you. Now, Abiola and Joy. 
Oh, Joy, you are muted, just, just like me before. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Uh, what I've tried to do is to put also on the chat, you can quickly go to the chat and then uh, get our information. We have hotlines, we are live chat, we have our website with information and necessary links. Uh, is www.wacolnigeria.org. Wacol, W-A-C-O-L, Nigeria.org. And it's all out there in the chat and you can copy it with the hotlines that we are, uh, we respond uh, to uh, victims and survivors of uh, sexual and gender-based violence and then also right. to provide uh, legal clinic and counseling. Thank you. Thank you so much. And now, Abiola. <laughs> Anyway, um, we are also, I'm also going to put that on the uh, on the chat, uh, our website and all the handles that you can link us or link up with us. I'm also going to put that on the manifesto so that we can also Thank link you. up with the manifesto. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, if people want to help, what can they do? Again, one minute each. Yeah, um, I, I think we all have to get involved. Uh, mm -hmm. What is very crucial for us succeeding in the fight to advance gender equality in Nigeria and beyond is solidarity. And that is where I want to appreciate you, sister, for this, uh, to give, for giving us this global voice uh, to talk about Women Festo, to talk about the status of women in Nigeria, to talk about uh, women's political situation in Nigeria. And I think we all need to, in solidarity with women, women from global north, women and men, I wouldn't say, because men do feminism as well. Uh, that in solidarity that the global north should support and continue to support uh, women from global south uh, to achieve also what they have taken for granted because the fighting for basic rights, I mean, uh, it, it's very basic right to survival and development is still a major issue. To be recognized as a human being with full legal personality, with a status in your dignity as a woman and, and, and a, a, a few fledged human being is still a problem. So, and we have all these uh, rights at international and regional level and even the constitutional provision. Uh, but then when it comes to implementation, there is a, a, a gulf between the law and, and, and practice. So we have to continue the agitation. Uh, we need a lot of uh, funding to continue the work we do and funding remains a greatest challenge even in a post COVID era. And, uh, and you know, the impact on Nigeria with economic recession, with all the borrowing with the Brenton Wood Institution, uh, it means less and less constrained space for work for women. Uh, civic space is shrinking and funding for women's uh, work is also shrinking. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, um, Lydia, what can people do to help if they want to? <laughs> oh, I don't see Lydia. Oh, I see her. So Lydia, can you unmute and tell us quickly? Yes, in view of the situation, the insecurity that we're facing in Nigeria now, we need more and more women to get involved in, um, in the sector of women, peace and security. And so we will, uh, we will appreciate a lot of support to be able to organize all the international, regional and national frameworks that Nigeria has signed onto so that we can, we can bring support to the thousands of Nigerian women and girls that are in captivity right now, either with Boko Haram or uh, with bandits or have been kidnapped, some of them from their schools. And this is becoming very unacceptable. It looks as if we need, we need help to be able to, 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 to deal with these issues. But the issues cannot be dealt with unless the people know the, know the provisions what is there for them to do and what they can do. And I think this is one area that we will appreciate support. All right, thank you so much. Now, Abiola, quickly. Everybody is not listening to me on this time constraint. <laughs> but Abiola, now. 
Yeah, well, I, I would say I will adopt what my sisters have said. Um, I, I agree with them entirely. And what we need is alliance building. And I, I also want to say that um, there are a lot of organizations because of the work that Women Investor does, working in grassroots communities that need a lot of support. I think we, we need to get those supports to women who are really building Nigeria, but which uh, they are not in the cities. So we, we, we don't know the amount of the work that they are doing. I think that we need much more support, you know, for women organizations that are working across the country to be able to, if Nigeria gets it right, I am very sure that other African countries will probably do better. Thank you so much. But maybe Nigeria should learn from other African countries. <laughs> All right. Because, I mean, Rwanda. I is, think they like... should learn. They should be humble enough to learn. All yes. Right. Nigeria first and others. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much. And I thank everybody that is here present for your patience, for your wonderful disposition. Now it's time for questions and comments and i hear there's one question in the um chat so tunji can you help us certainly um we have one question from janet johnson to everyone i'm losing my earpiece okay my students read and discussed the woman manifesto today masterpiece one notable omission i understand how complicated the context context is and I wonder if there was any discussion of including LGBTQ rights in the Woman Manifesto, or whether this is not an issue that can be raised even amongst women's groups. Great question. So now the three speakers, who would like to go first? Well, um, I think I will go first. Um, if we look at the Women Manifesto, there's an area that is dealing with sexual and reproductive health rights, and um, where we um, add um, demands, you know, in relation to issues of women's reproductive rights than uh, some other uh, issue. I, I think one of the challenges that we're having currently in the country, why this might not, uh, because I, I want to say that um, um, Women Manifesto is not in any way opposed to the LGBTQ rights. Um, maybe the reason why it didn't come up here is because there's a law in Nigeria, you know, currently as well as lawing uh, us putting such advocacy uh, in a document of this nature. But I want to say that we're not in any way, you know, as feminists opposed to the uh, rights of LGBTQ. All right. Now, um, Joy. Yeah, um, thank you so much. I think I will adopt uh, what my sister uh, said. And uh, when it comes to uh, diversity, um, uh, sexual orientation issues and, and the position of Nigeria and some of our African country, uh, I think uh, we, we know where, where they are in AU and, and how some of these issues are contentious. And uh, But importantly, when you have to put it in print, uh, you have to bear in mind as a lawyer, uh, what are the existing law and the extant law currently the law uh, that was passed in 2014 uh, that is called same sex uh, marriage prohibition act act mean even prohibit advocacy for lgbt rights so uh, that already can be a ground for prosecution uh, but that have not stopped women in terms of adopting feminist principles and human rights principles that, that is uh, that principle of uh, diversity, equality, inclusion, and, and non-discrimination. And that is, as a, as a human rights lawyer, as a, as a gender activist, as a feminist, I also respect uh, and, uh, and believe also in rights uh, of everyone. And, and it's important uh, uh, that we recognize that. And even persons with disability too, um, because uh, is uh, even though uh, the, 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 the law might be a bit more sympathetic to them, but for women with disability, they are also uh, doubly uh, jeopardized. Okay, thank you. And now, um, Lydia, would you like to chip in yes. or should we? Okay. Yes, yes, please. Uh, personally, I'm not opposed to LGBT rights. 
because um, people are entitled to rights of uh, diversity. But the stage at which we are, especially in the very uh, elementary stage of getting people to understand that they even have sex and reproductive rights. Right now in the northern part of the country, some women think they cannot even determine the number of children that they can have. They think it's the prerogative of their husbands. And um, so we are just taking it one step at a time. I think at this stage, it is um, a bit premature for us to begin to uh, working with introduce this um, LGBT rights to them. So we just keep uh, hoping that they will understand that uh, people are entitled to, 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 to their rights. And uh, even if you don't believe in it, you need to respect it. Thank you. All right, thank you. So I see um, a hand up and uh, Tunji, if you can also just help me scan and see if there's any other questions. So I see Florence Binigay's um, hand up. I'm sorry if I'm murdering your name. Um, your very brief question, please. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon. I, good afternoon. I really have more of a commendation and a way forward than a question. First of all, I would like to appreciate the organizers of this event. This is a very laudable one. The first, I think, is taking place to help the downtrodden in a country that is having helpless people like the women, the children, and the physically challenged. And this event will go a long way to support our cause. Secondly, I have to appreciate the three speakers, the three leaders, women leaders in, in, uh, in Nigeria that are fronting the, to see that women's rights are upheld, especially this time around where we are trying to have the constitution amendment. We really want the women's rights issues, the five issues on ground to be placed on record in our constitution so that we will have a long lasting position for women's rights. So I thank you so much for all you have discussed. And I just pray that this event will help us to push a, to go ahead. Like they rightly said, I think Abiola mentioned the issue of grassroots women. It is very important to really involve the grassroots women. And to involve the grassroots women due to the diversity and the, and the, the larger uh, population of Nigeria needs a lot of funding. So we have been trying to squeeze ourselves to see what we could do to achieve these, uh, these rights. If we can get support, I think it will go a long way because every, every uh, lawmaker has a constituency that they represent. And if they are held bound at their local constituency, they will know that it's not an international issue. It is a local issue. It is an issue involving people that have voted for them especially the women. So I thank you so much. And I pray that we have some support to continue this struggle. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Florence. Thank you so much, my sister. Uh, do we have any other um, comments or questions? Um, there are lots of positive comments that um, I've seen. So maybe read, read some of them to the whole group. Please. Okay, certainly. Give me one second to go back up because I have it in a different section. Okay. Basically, um, like I said, a lot of positive things. Excellent meeting, excellent conversation, great panel, excellent moderation. Thanking uh, everyone so much for this insightful session. Uh, lots of shared information, uh, lots of requests for information, um, incredible discussion on the status of women in Africa via the Nigerian case study. Thank you, Funke Okome and Brooklyn College for putting this event together. And pretty much a lot of, like I said, positive uh, comments. And I'll check again to see if any uh, 
last questions. And if you'd like to say anything, or if you'd like me to uh, begin to close it out. Yes, I think what we, um, what I want to get is kind of like a very brief list. What are the next steps? Because I heard from Abiola that Nigerian women have given a seven day ultimatum, right? To the National Assembly. Is that right? Abiola? Yes, we have, we have, yes, we have written to them to respond to us within seven days. Okay, yes. so if they don't respond, what is going to happen? We will restart the dice. All right. And what is your thinking in terms of what you might do? Um, well, in terms as of the, today, as of today, women are in the 36 states across the country, organizing and mobilizing. Um, we will decide on what to do. We will decide on what to do. Let me just say that. But, mm. but I, I think also that the social and legislative advocacy uh, continues. Uh, yeah. There is no shortcut to agitating uh, for what is our right. And yes. uh, the, the elections are coming up and women are determined to be included and not to be left out in 2023. We want to make progress and we have to demand and raise the gender accountability stake. Thank you. And Lydia, final word. What do you see as the next step? Yes, my final word is that, um, yes, we are talking about women political participation in general, but we cannot win this in isolation of all other developmental issues. So, and that is why the, the idea of having a movement is very good women groups that work in various sectors are all part of it and they are all part of Women Manifesto. And that is why I particularly like working for Women Manifesto because together we can do a lot. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. So over no to retreat. you. No surrender. <laughs> yeah, okay. Aluta no continua, no surrender. surrender. Okay. No surrender. Aluta continua. Victoria Asata. Asata. All right. Yeah. This one so, continues. And victory is certain. Very yes. So, yes. Thank you so much. I am very appreciative that you responded to our call, that you gave us real incisive analysis and an idea of your work. Thank you for bearing with me when I was kind of rude and saying, okay, wrap up, wrap up. <laughs> um, but we are really over time now. So I'll turn it over to Tunji to say um, the, you know, final greetings. Thank you so much. I mean, it's definitely an understatement to say that this was an important discussion and we're certainly only limited by time today. I mean, we could talk indefinitely, but since our time has come to an end, I really want to thank everyone again for coming together in our audience. Thank Professor Akome for organizing this. I want to thank all of our co-sponsors and especially our panelists. For all of you who contributed, who shared information, asked questions, and shared positive comments. Thank you so much. I hope you enjoy the rest of your day or evening, depending on your location. Take care, thank everyone. Bye-bye. Thank, thank you, everyone. Thank you very thank much. You so Bye. much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. And if anybody thank wants to come thank, 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 thank you. Thank you. Thank you. can turn on thank your you. video. I'll take a screenshot. <laughs> OK. <laughs> Especially speakers. What I mean, everybody, if you can turn on your screen, <laughs> let me mm -hmm. try to take a screenshot. I learned that from going to the fixed politics thing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay, so let me see if yeah. I can do what I said out. Hey, okay. everybody, when I, Hello. See, I see a lot of names. Videos, please. Okay. If you okay. can. Okay. <laughs> so, Tunji, can you help me and take screenshots? <laughs> sure, I certainly can. Thank let me you. make my screen big. So thank you so much. I think we should have more of this kind of fora so that we get to yes. know from Brooklyn what's happening in the African continent and around the world, especially the global south. 
Thank you. Bye bye. Couldn't agree okay. more. Focusing Thank on you. The, focusing on Thank the gender you. aspect of things enables us to see the full picture. So. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.